Two Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. This two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you to the generous underwriters of Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Monday, July 10th, we're studying Psalm 34. In today's text, King David invites all who pray along with him to taste and to see that the Lord is good, for the Lord is the God who continually provides for and delivers his people. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us returning guest, Pastor Jason Schockman. Pastor Schockman serves at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. Pastor Schockman, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Thanks, glad to be here. So Pastor Schockman, we've been looking at a variety of psalms so far in the month of July here on Sharper Iron, and this is the first one that really has a, a superscription of a little bit more detail than some, so I'm just going to get us started with that. The superscription, which is in fact a part of the text of the Scriptures, it says this, "...of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, so that he drove him out and he went away." So let's just jump right into that. What, what should we understand from the superscription of Psalm 34? Uh, that this has historical context. This isn't a psalm that David just pulls out of the thin air because he felt like writing a song. First uh, Samuel is where we have to go. Uh, so I'm frantically turning in my Bible because uh, I don't have it all memorized uh, clearly. First uh, Samuel 21, uh, David is being pursued by Saul, who wants to kill him. Uh, This is right after the whole Jonathan shoots the arrows as a sign to David that he's not safe. Uh, And David flees. He goes to uh, the temple to Ahimelech, which is not the same as Abimelech. He goes to Ahimelech and uh, gets the bread, the holy bread, uh, and eats it, uh, and uh, takes the sword of Goliath from Ahimelech because he has no spear or weapon. And then he flees uh, to the king of Gath, that is Achish, uh, and, and before, so the king of the Philistines, right? Uh, and so that's a story, right? Uh, <laughs> the king sees David, or the king's advisors rather, see David come into town with ostensibly Phil- the, the Philistine giant Goliath's sword in hand. Uh, this is not a comforting thing for a nation who has been routed by David in the past to the tune of which the people of Israel would sing, uh, Saul struck down his thousands, David his ten thousands. Uh, He's a bit of a known quantity in Gath. So here he walks in, ostensibly alone, with the sword of Goliath in hand, uh, and the advisors to the king aren't real comforted by this. And so the king says, well, bring him to me. So they do. And uh, David decides, you know, I kind of don't want to die here all by myself. So he plays the part of the madman, uh, lets his uh, drool drain down into his beard. Um he makes marks on the doors of the house where they put him to kind of make him appear to be crazy. Uh, when the king gets word of this, he says, I got enough crackpots in this town. I don't need one more. Get David out of here. And so David goes. Uh, and he, he actually flees um, then back to 
uh, the the cave of Adulam, which that's a whole nother story for a whole nother time because there's a lot of rich stuff there. That's right. Which, again, brings us back to Psalm 34. Uh, David, when he changed his behavior, uh, which apparently is a Hebrew idiom for acted like a fool. Hmm. Hmm. That I'm, I'm, I think that there's maybe more to this than uh, in transformer terms meets the eye. Do you want to talk about that here at the outset, or do you want to go through the psalm a little bit first and then maybe come back to that? Uh, maybe we'll come back to that. Okay, okay. One one note that I do think is worth pointing out here at the outset from the superscription, especially having gone back to 1 Samuel 21. In 1 Samuel 21, the name of the Philistine king there is given as Achish, and here the name is given as Abimelech. Can you resolve that for us? Sure. Uh, much the same way that the kings of Egypt were called Pharaoh, um, we understand the kings of the Philistines were called Abimelech. Uh, that that word means uh, kingdom of my father or father, my king. Right. All so right. It, it would be a term of respect that all the Philistines would use for their king. Gotcha. Kind of like you'd call Which, any British king his majesty, and then he'd have correct. a name. So Abimelech correct. is the title, and Achish is the name. Correct. All right. Very good. Well, you let's know, go ahead then with some pastor, of that historical... Go ahead. Pastor is the title. Apple is go. the name. There you go. That's right. That's right. We do this all the time. So same thing's happening here with the superscription with Psalm 34 in comparison to the name given in First Samuel 21. Let's go ahead then and take a look at this text from Psalm 34, the rest of the psalm. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. That's our text for today. That is Psalm 34. Pastor Shockman, before we look at individual verses, just kind of give us a big picture view of this psalm. What's, what's David praying here? He's praying a, pray, a prayer of thanksgiving, um, in, inviting others to rejoice with him in the God who saves. Um, the again, the context is kind of kind of important to note. Uh, David is being pursued. Uh, Saul, the king of Israel, is murderously threatened him, um, it, even throwing the spear at his own son. Right. Uh, David is on the run. He's, he's in the, the camp of the enemy before the king of the enemy, and his life is on the line, and he's alone. Hmm. Um, it, so 
The fact that he starts with, I will bless the Lord at all times, is significant, right? Not just in the good times, because these aren't good times that David is remembering. Um, his, his praise will continually be in my mouth. I wonder how how he did that when he was playing the part of the madman. Um, you know, how, how often do we uh, see people that that talk about Jesus incessantly hmm. and and just kind of look at them like do you are you connected to reality? Like you know, like the the guy on the street corner that you walk past, the the maybe the homeless guy that you walk past, and and he's just, oh Lord bless you, Jesus bless you, Lord bless you. We got a couple of those in the Milwaukee area, uh, and I always consider as I listen that perhaps the Holy Spirit is working even through them to declare His word of blessing, to declare His word of, I don't know that the name of Christ would be praised, right? And so then I I go listen to the apostles try to tell Jesus to make those other people be quiet. And he's like, no, (laughs) no. Whether they do it genuinely or not, it's not them doing the work, right? The the gospel is proclaimed. Mm. Take us Mm. into the next two verses of the psalm. You know, we bring this... Yeah, sure. Hang hang on, though, before we run away from there. Uh, You could easily... Uh, jump to the New Testament from here too, right? Bless the Lord at all times. Yeah. Um, this is this is Paul, right? Romans eight twenty eight. All things, all things, work together for the good of the saints, right? Those who are called according to His purpose. Uh, so we can bless the Lord at all times. Um, th- that His praise is continually in our mouth. Uh, next couple of verses, then. Uh, my soul makes it to boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Um, <laughs> yeah, hmm. you ever you ever listen to people or talk to people, and it is apparent from their reaction or their their language that there is nobody that's going to be able to tell them no thing that they haven't already considered. Hmm. Um. They, you could say it, they refuse to let anyone tell them anything. You know, kind of like the, the women running away from the tomb, the empty tomb, who said no thing to nobody. Yeah. Right? They just, they just went. Uh, I think what's here in verse 2 and 3 is David is both saying... I'm not going to boast in myself, but I'm going to boast in the Lord. I'm going to listen to what he has said and repeat it. So magnify the Lord with me, right? Let us exalt his name together. That is, we're not not boasting in ourselves. Um, This is the same David who wrote, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Uh, This is the same David, by the way. Who, who led the people of Israel in dancing before the Ark of the Covenant as it was brought into the, the city. Um, it, and yet he was glad when they said to me. Um, that it's almost as if let them or let the humble hear is, a, is, a, is as much a word of instruction as it is a declaration to those who are humble, right? An instruction that we ought to be humble, to receive the word of God in patience, to receive it with open ears, to to hear it and consequently be trained by it and rejoice in it um, rather than uh, come to the word with, with all of our prejudice and and all of our bias and uh, and then fall into evil and in trying to translate it the way we want it to be translated instead of letting God's word say what it says. So he continues then, and this is where he really starts to invite others into this praise. I mean, you think about David who has gone into Gath 
he's the one who's received this treatment, but now he calls others, and that's a part of what's going on here in this introduction, I think, is that he's calling others to join him in the praise of God, not only for what the Lord's done for David, but what the Lord does for his people in general. Yes. So let us exalt his name together. Not, not just me alone. Yeah, that's right. So magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Now keep, keep going through what, what David says in verses four and following. So, I sought yeah, the So Lord. what did he do, right? Yeah, he, he, he sought the Lord. He reached out. He prayed. Uh, he, was, he was following after uh, what God had called him to do and to be, uh, and, and the Lord answered. And what, how did the Lord answer, right? He delivered me from all my fears. Those, those who look to him are radiant and their faces will never be ashamed. Um, and, um, right. This is the kind of the, the idea of the face of Moses as he comes down off the mountain, right. Reflecting the glory of God, uh, more so, um, there is, because there is forgiveness with the Lord, right. We, we are his his face shines on us. He lifts his countenance upon us, and we have his peace. I think I've read that somewhere before. Yeah, yeah. the The image of the the faces of those looking to the Lord being radiant stands. It's it's striking in the context of what we looked at in First Samuel twenty one, where David's face doesn't look so radiant. Maybe in Gath. Yeah, where you know he's got spit and drool all over the right. place, and uh, the 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 point. The point that the contrast rather that David makes is there. No, there's nothing to be embarrassed about mm-hmm. when you when you are when you are in seeking the counsel of the Lord. Yeah. Um, yeah. We we don't have to be ashamed before Him uh, for for Christ. Right, Christ is our all. Um, this and this is just such a wonder uh, that. Uh, as as you and I kind of were talking backstage, uh, as I'm digging through the commentaries on this on this psalm, so few actually bring this back to Jesus. Hmm. They they seem to make it about this this list of attributes to aspire to, or these these reasons for praise. Because here's a poor man who cried and God answered. Right, that's uh, verse six, by the way. Um, yeah. That, that God saves. And so we just have to be these kind of people and, and trust that God saves. Um, and, and so fittingly, it's, it's Luther uh, who, who says, no, no, this is all about Jesus. So talk more about uh, that, how this is all yeah. about Jesus. So, oh, golly. Um, at least get us started on that conversation. Sure, sure. Uh, the, Luther says this of Psalm thirty-four. Luther says this. I'll just give you some Luther. Uh, Therefore, the psalmist, with the title alone, diligently brings the whole story to the mysteries in a very long and beautiful statement. The prophet, for he was an outstanding prophet understanding his own story in a mystical sense, wrote this psalm about Christ, to whom he understood the mystery of the matter applying. And this is clear because when he said, when he changed, of course, he did not compose or have this psalm at the time, but later when he reflected on this event, therefore David, that is Christ, changed his countenance in the time of suffering For then the letter began to be put aside and the spirit revealed when the scriptures were fulfilled. And now the face of the prophets and the forms of Moses would go to the face of the apostles and the veil of Moses would be removed and the cross of Christ began to move forward. So just as Achish was offended at David, so the Jews were offended at the lowly suffering of Christ as if he were a fool. He willingly submitted to this folly, made folly and madness and curse for us that we might be wise. Therefore, 
in the form of this deed of David, the suffering of Christ is expressed, by means of which he was put to flight by those who are Abimelech, the kingdom of my father. And thus to the present day, he departed to the Gentiles through the resurrection. But they are called kingdom of my father, that is of David, who was the father of Christ after the flesh. And the passage upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom tells us, and the angel Gabriel said, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, that is the father my king. And so the Jewish people were Christ's and the true king's father after the flesh. And David, the servants of Achish who brought David to him, they all fell on their hands. Hmm. I mean, he, he, may, he just goes on and on, right? The, Luther sees clearly in every line of this psalm, David is not just talking about himself, but he is prefiguring Christ who comes in the midst of us who seems to be foolish, who is a poor man, who cries out, and how does the Lord save him out of all his troubles? Well, he leads him to a cross and he dies there. Yeah. But he's resurrected, right? He's, he's saved from all his troubles. So if I, if I can kind of go with that thought of Luther and try to think about what we've looked at so far in Psalm 34 in that light, then perhaps, say, verse 5, those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. Think about that image, as you normally would picture it, and now compare it to the image of Christ's face on the cross. O oh, sacred head, now wounded, as we sing during the season of Lent and in Holy Week. Yeah, with, with grief and shame weighed down. Yeah. How is that radiance? Huh. Well, what does Jesus pray before he goes to the cross? Father, glorify your name. Yeah. Right? So in the, in the cross, in the cross, real quick, in the cross, yeah. we see the full wrath of God against sin poured out. And we see forgiveness manifest. Hmm. And we see the complete the complete work of salvation done. It is finished. Yeah. So, in, I mean, thinking it through Psalm 34 like that helps us to see, well, what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 1, that although the cross looks like foolishness or weakness to the world, for us who are being saved, it's truly the power and the wisdom of God. Yeah. So to the to the world, it's an aroma of of death, the death of Christ, to death, our death. But to God, it's it's the it's the sweet aroma of Christ. Hmm. That's gold. Yeah. That's that's a glorious thing. Hmm. And so then, I mean, if we can try to take this and connect it to the way we would join David in this prayer, then especially seeing Christ's own suffering and death within this psalm, we've been connected to Christ, to his death and his resurrection and holy baptism. And so when we find ourselves, you know, in, in whatever trouble it may be, whether it's akin to what David experienced, whatever that trouble looks like, we too can join in this prayer knowing the outcome will not bring us to shame, no matter what our face may look like right now, because of what Christ has gone through for us and has taken us through that with him. Uh, we, we probably should just run right ahead to verse 9. Well, we, we haven't even talked about 7 or 8 yet. Oh, well, maybe we'll come back. Okay, oh, take us to verse Lord 9 you, and we'll come back to 7 and 8. Yeah. Oh, fear the Lord you, his saints, his holy ones. For those who fear him have no lack, Right. That's Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Mm. I lack nothing. Yeah. Wait a minute. How, that, how can that be true in this present world? Because there's lots of stuff that I want mm. that I don't have. But that doesn't mean I'm lacking. I have, 
I have Christ. In everything, I have Christ. What more could I need? I have forgiveness and life and salvation. So, so even when my present circumstances stink, I have the joy of the Lord that is my strength. Uh, recently, the uh, side note, re- we'll go, then we'll go back to seven and eight. Uh, recently, the Oklahoma Sooners girls softball team uh, won sectionals, and they were being interviewed on, on ESPN Plus about how they played with such passion and such joy over such a grueling length of time. And they, they, they've got 51 wins in a row, right? How do you keep up the passion? How do you keep up the, the zeal? Three players in a row, all with different language, all with different phrasing. So it's not like it's a, it's a coined, patented, like, talking point that they've been told to talk about. All three players in a row. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Uh, Joy is in Jesus. Happiness is in temporary circumstances. We have Christ. We lack nothing. Uh, right? All three players in a row talked that way. Like the, the reporters come back to the coach. They're like, uh, uh, same question, coach. Obviously searching for a different answer that they can use as a sound bite. And the coach is like, yeah, I don't think it can be said any better than these three ladies just did. Fantastic. Mic drop. So if listeners, if you haven't seen that, uh, go look it up on YouTube. Uh, Blaze TV interviews the Oklahoma Sooners girls softball. Uh, outstanding. Fantastic. Um, so back to seven. Well, yeah, let's, right, back to seven and eight. Let's actually or let's pick up those verses on the other side of the break. We do need to need to take Got a break. It. So we've covered verse nine, seen examples of that in life today. We're going to come back to this psalm on the other side. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We're talking to Pastor Jason Shockman this morning about Psalm 34. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Monday, July 10th. We're studying Psalm 34 with Pastor Jake Jason Shockman. He serves at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. Pastor Shockman, prior to the break, we were we jumped ahead to verse 9, but we skipped over verses 7 and 8. Take us into those two verses. The angel of the Lord. Uh, we should probably stop right there. Yeah. <laughs> the, the I mean, this is no just general angel. This is the angel of the Lord, the Melak Yahweh, God's messenger who is sent to protect those who fear the Lord to carry out his divine will on earth, namely salvation. Hmm. Who's that? Hmm. Salvation. That's the name for the Lord Jesus. Oh, right. Yeshua. Yeah. Um, yeah. The angel of the Lord uh, encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. No, when they, no, if they, this is what he does. He delivers. Right? Uh, we, because we have this, our Lord Christ himself, uh, who is called the angel of the great council, the messenger of the God, right? messenger of God, uh, the prophets called him the angel of the Lord, uh, we then move into these uh, these ten imperatives in verses eight through fourteen, hmm. right? um, and again, you got you gotta get the deliverance first. Again, we I mentioned this earlier as I was looking at commentaries; they all made this psalm about how to kind of how to be a better Christian, hmm. right? Um, but it was all. It was all motivated in cultivating these, 
these characteristics of seeking and following after and and doing good because it's not natural or easy for us. So we have to work at it. And there's some truth to that. But where does that come from? It comes from being delivered. Right? Uh, again, context of where David writes this, this psalm from. He doesn't get delivered from Abimelech or Achish, whoever you want to call him. Right? Because... He was so virtuous, that is, David was so virtuous or holy. He, he gets delivered because the Lord delivered him. So David gives credit where credit is due. And even says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. You don't believe me? Have a bite. Yeah. Taste and see. Right? Uh, seeing is believing, we would say. Uh, John, in his gospel, would say, believing is seeing. Yeah. Hmm. Right? Yeah. Uh, so, t- taste and see that the Lord is good. Uh, for though, again, he was saying to you, have no lack. This is, this is good. Uh, you, c- c- taste and see. Can you trust him? Can you trust the Lord? Is he the same God yesterday, today, and always? Yes. So we can trust him. Yes. Yes. All the time. All the time. Even, even when, in the midst uh, of our, even in, go ahead. Well, I was to say, even, I mean, I'm just thinking through the, the sufferings of our Lord again, even when what we're tasting is the, the bitter, the sour wine on the cross. Yeah. Uh, as drinking the cup of wrath to its dregs. Yeah. Yeah. So that then we get to taste the cup of blessing. That's the cup from yeah. which we drink. Yeah. Taste and see the Lord is good. Yeah. Right. Verse 10, the young lions suffer want and hunger. Uh, young lions. Um, yeah. You have those any of those in economy think, walk? Young lions? N- not, not literally, um, <laughs> but young young lions like those those who think themselves or think much of themselves mm. right um uh, i wrote a note down about that one hang on i got to find it Mm-mm-mm. oh yeah uh people who rely on their own strength mm. are like the young lions right and Luther would actually go go into this from the standpoint of uh, any time, any time you you rely on you, you, you're missing the boat, right? Um, that is, the meek are those who are patient to hear; they are blessed and they are made joyful. But there are others who refuse to let anyone tell them anything, as the Germans say it, because they rely too much on their own prudence Mm. and they fall into evil. Okay, so bring that into today, Pastor. Here's the deal. How many of us have a pet sin that we return to day in and day out, even though we know it's sin and even though it it, it horrifies us and we repent of it and and we strive to turn away from it and then we make it like three days without that sin, and and we go, oh, man, three days, I'm doing all right. Mm-hmm. And on the fourth day, you're neck deep in it. Uh, it you know, this is, talk, talk to an addict. When do they stop being an addict? Never. Mm-hmm. Right? Every day is one day at a time. One day at a time. Aren't aren't we all kind of that way when it comes to sin? Mm-hmm. Especially the the ones that we tend to gravitate toward, right? Because we're sinners, right? Because that's why we sin. So and so, we are a people who who are called to not do anyone evil. And, and think that that's enough. 
Okay, well, I didn't do bad to somebody. But is that enough? Mm-hmm. Doesn't the gospel say that uh, it's not it's not that the rich man uh, suffered because he didn't do he because he did harm to Lazarus? No, no, he was condemned because he didn't do anything good to Lazarus. More so, he just didn't believe the word of God, which would have motivated him to do good to Lazarus. Right. So, uh, another psalm would say, he who walks blamelessly does what is right. Hmm. right. Turning away from evil and doing good, are those the same thing? I think they're, they go together. But it is, I mean, sure. you talk of, yeah, they, they go together. But as, as we talk about in the, the catechism, each of the commandments gives us evil to avoid and good to do. And so if all you ever do is just avoid the evil, but you don't actually do the good, right? you, you still have sin to confess. Yeah. Yeah, right? Because it, <laughs> not doing evil is just as important as doing good right. or said differently, right? Failing to do that, which I know I ought to do is just as wicked as doing that, which I know I ought not to do. Right. right. It's, it's law on either side. Right. Right. That, that law so, is on so, either side. So in it's verses kind of 11 through 14, but keep, keep going pastor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right. I was just going to say, uh, <laughs> There, there is, there is a life uh, that that is no end of pursuing this good. It's because there's nobody here on the face of the earth that can grasp it. Uh, so and so, so Paul says, right? It's not that I have already obtained this or that I'm already perfect, but I follow after or I seek after this, that in some way I may apprehend it. Even Paul says, I don't always get it. So back to verse 11. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What is a man who, or what man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Right? We're, we're saying, he, listen, be teachable, be taught. Keep your tongue from evil. Keep your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. And again, there's that not only things to avoid, but things to do. Right. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, in, I think in those verses, you know, you have that sense of, of wisdom. This is what a godly life looks like. This is, this is good for you. And we don't want to lose that. We should hold on to that and seek after these things in this life. At the same time, I also think, as we've been talking about seeing this psalm in light of Christ, when you get to verse 12, what man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? And you you hear in verses 13 and 14 what that looks like. You do see as Christ, I think you see, Christ as the fulfillment of that man who desires life, loves many days, and does those things in verses 13 and 14 perfectly. Yes. So then the, the <laughs> fear of the Lord in verse 11, again, is, is not, it's not only, like, we see that fear of the Lord not only in the way that we seek to put these things into practice as Christians— but we also see the fear of the Lord then as putting our trust in the one who's done these things perfectly for us, both things going on at once. Y- y- yes, that is uh, what Scripture has advised us to do uh, as we live in the sight of God f- from the beginning, right? Let the righteous exult before God. Uh, 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 Psalm, Psalm 16, um, or Psalm 5, right? Direct my way in your sight, O God. Um, I set the Lord always in my sight, David would say. Um, the, the, uh, the Apostle Paul says, um, we aim at what is good, right? For every man's conscience in the sight of God. Uh, so, so the beginning of the psalm is an example of humility um, that, that we would 
think less of ourselves and more of Christ who is our all in all. Um, even Job went so far as to curse the day of his birth (laughs) rather than glory in himself. Uh, right. We could run to the good old Lutheran favorite of Ephesians two, eight and nine. Uh, you're saved by grace. It's a gift of God. It's not a work. So nobody can boast about it. Right. But you got to include verse 10 for you. You are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that God prepared beforehand so you could walk in them, right? So, so the, the confession of our sin, where we fail to do these good things, actually gives glory and praise to God because it, it diverts the praise and glory from us. And so then God, uh, who doesn't want to share his glory or his praise, right? He's a jealous God, uh, He doesn't want anything loved beside himself. This is the first commandment. Have no other gods. And so when when we bring that idea of Jesus is the fulfillment of of these verses uh, that encourage us to seek this this peace and to pursue it, then, then we begin to maybe have a better understanding of, of Matthew when he says, seek first the kingdom of God. Hmm. Right? And that is, seek first Jesus and his righteousness, not a righteousness of our own. Right? Um, hmm. Yeah. If we, look, if we look at God and his righteousness and we, and we try to add any of our own, what are we really saying? Wow. Christ died for nothing is the way Paul puts it in Galatians. Yeah, right. (laughs) Quite abruptly, indeed. Right? Um, So so the scripture speaks and it it appears to us in which which we are disposed to hear it. Um, so, So the Lord speaks about our sin according to our understanding. And in this way, sin, namely as it's recognized and as it's confessed, manifests and praises the grace of God. Right? Uh, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But when we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I think I've said that a few thousand times in my life. Um, there's a reason you've said it a few thousand times. <laughs> Me too. Because I need it. That's right. right? Uh, so, and, and so thus, Paul would call himself the chief of sinners, right? Uh, not just because he's aware of God of his own sin, but because all the more powerfully, he's aware of God's grace. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and so here in this psalm, right, David encourages us to listen to what the fear of the Lord is. And the fear of the Lord is Jesus. That's right. On this side of the cross, right? On this side of the cross, the fear of the Lord is Jesus. Uh, on that on that side of the cross, it's trusting in God's promises, clinging to his purposes, knowing God is the God who delivers. I mean, have you not paid attention? Have you not read that he delivered them from the hand of Pharaoh, right? I mean, for for the Old Testament people, as they go back to the Exodus story time and time and time and time again, uh, God meets them on Mount Sinai, and it all starts with, I am the Lord your God who delivered you out of a house of slavery and bondage. You will have no other gods before me. We, we often think, uh, as you've made mention of the Ten Commandments catechetically, that they start with, you shall have no other gods. And then there's a, a keep it, or a don't break it and a keep it aspect to each of the commandments. Right? The Jewish people actually start numbering the commandments with, I am the Lord your God, who yeah. brought you out of the house of slavery and bondage in Egypt. They start with the gospel, with God declaring who he is. This psalm declares again and again and again, who God is and who is he? 
He's near to the brokenhearted. Mm -hmm. He's against those who do evil. He delivers the righteous. He hears the righteous. He he helps them. Uh, He saves the crushed in spirit. Mm -hmm. The Lord delivers out of all of his troubles. And then we get to verse 20. He, so let me let me read verse 20 for us again. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Why why do you highlight that? I would say this word? is a very I would say this is a very specific example of God's care. Yes. Uh you you could make reference to uh, God's very specific instructions about how to treat bones in the Passover meal. So let's just go dig. So we'll call it a wild goose chase. Uh, Exodus chapter 12. I'm flipping pages and digging here. So Exodus chapter 12 is the instructions for the Passover and the meal as the Lord is preparing to pass over his people there in the land of Egypt. What verse? Specifically, verse 46. All right. So Exodus 12, verse 46 says this. This is the the Lord giving instructions to Moses and Aaron. It, that is the Passover, shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh outside the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. That's particularly speaking about the lamb, I believe. Indeed. The lamb. Okay. Don't so break the any lamb. of the bones of the lamb. Right. Yeah. So, he keeps all his bones, now one of them is broken. Okay. And by the way, in the context of this psalm, that, that is referring to the righteous. Hmm. That's right. Yeah, he's the one yeah, of you the, in verse 19. Right? The righteous. Not, we have seven and a half minutes left, Pastor Shockman, so make sure you get, get to yeah, what yeah. we're going to. <laughs> we're there right now. Okay, Fantastic. so then go to John nineteen thirty six. We're on it. All right. John 19, John 19 36. 36. This is right after the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ, as John records it for us. And in John nineteen thirty six, we read, For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. What's John helping us Specifically to see? Specifically citing Psalm. John is helping us to see Jesus in Psalm 34. Yeah. He's, in fact, saying, this is Jesus in Psalm 34, the righteous one, the brokenhearted, the crushed in spirit, the righteous who cries for help, the cut off, uh, the, the righteous, back to verse 15. I'm just working backwards through the text here. Right, yeah. The one who turns away from evil and does good. The one who doesn't speak deceit. The one who keeps his tongue from evil. The, you read it, you read Jesus backwards and it's, it, he's in every verse. Hmm. Yeah. He's all over the psalm. Okay. Uh, and so in this strange and profound uh, theology, we are hearers who have what has been heard. We already have it. And we believe it. Only because we've received it. We don't make it happen. We don't, we don't affect God's salvation being given to us. But we believe it. And therefore, we praise the Lord. And our soul blesses him. And he blesses us because we are the righteous, because Christ is the righteous, and we are in him. Yeah. Right. So because so good we... luck boasting of your own righteousness. Ha, ha, ha. Right. So, I mean, seeing, seeing Jesus then in these various ways throughout Psalm 34, I mean, does take us right back to the beginning of it, so that we would then bless the Lord at all times— we would make our boast in him. We would join together with all the people of God in this kind of boasting, in this kind of blessing of the Lord, rather than blessing ourselves or boasting about our own righteousness. Instead, we boast in in Christ. 
or, or even getting all fired up and, and uppity about uh, doing church right or, you know, making our nation right. You've been made right in Christ. It's already yours. So rejoice in it and proclaim his salvation day to day that evermore we would say, God is great. Yeah. I think yeah. I've read that somewhere before too. Yeah. The other the other thing that I do I think is important in seeing Christ in Psalm 34 in this way is the way that it it brings us comfort and and strength in the midst of our own sufferings. And the the verse that that I'm looking at right now in regard to that is from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, particularly verse 5 where St. Paul says, as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. I I think to see Christ as the suffering servant in Psalm 34 then helps us when we suffer, so that we know we have, as the writer of Hebrews says, we have a high priest who knows what it's like. He's he's shared in our sufferings. I think that's a, a pretty key point too. Yeah. Big time. Uh, if I can, if I can go with you, then uh, sure. to Second Corinthians and, chapter one. Perfect. And just as a way of to help, we've got about three minutes here, so so feel free yep. to take us in that direction and also help us to wrap things up. Got it. Uh, so if you go right to verse three, Second Corinthians one three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of all mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort we ourselves are comforted by God. God keeps pouring out comfort for you in Christ, who endured all things for you that in him you might be comforted. He doesn't stop. And if we are going to comfort other people, We just got to keep getting filled up with Jesus as we give him and his comfort to other people. It's not because we have that in and of ourselves. And when we try to use our experience or our our joy or our knowledge, rather than relying on Christ, we always give people that which is secondary. Instead of going to Christ himself and letting his comfort and his joy be what goes forth from our mouth. If Psalm 34 is about David and his experience, it doesn't do much good for me. But if Psalm 34 is about Christ, then I have no lack. Yeah. And it, and it is about Christ so that we do have no lack. We have absolutely everything we need in the one who has suffered for our sins, and who has been raised for our justification. Pastor Jason Schockman serves at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. He has been helping us today to study Psalm 34. Pastor Schockman, thanks for being our guest today. Absolutely my joy, Pastor Apple. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Taste and see, dear friends, Jesus Christ is good. He has suffered for you. He has endured these afflictions in your place so that you can taste and see that the Lord has a cup of blessing for you, the cup of salvation that you get to drink so that you would not boast in yourself, but rather you would boast in the Lord and you have no lack in him. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about Psalm 34, please send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It is always a joy to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.